I don't think I would have the same career and Mouse Guard would have become what it is without our next guest. To give creator commentary for his Legends of the Guard story, Archaea founder, author, and illustrator, Mark Smiley. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> so, Mark, you, uh, you had a comic series called Artesia. <laughs> yes, uh, one, once... Once upon a time, as it were, uh, I had uh, I had started off. Uh, I mean, it, it was actually very similar to you in, in the sense that it was, uh, you know, rather than there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to try and get into comics, and and I kind of took the route of just like I'm just going to write and draw kind of a book that I that I wanted to see kind of out in the world, uh, and then found a publisher for it, and then uh, after a while, um, I, I did two series with my first publisher, a company called Sirius. Um, and then, uh, 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 for a variety of circumstances, wound up leaving them. And then, uh, in the intervening year afterwards, sort of, you know, in trying to find a new publisher, I, I also started started thinking about that question of self-publishing. I mean, I'd, I'd done a bunch of research on self-publishing before I had found Sirius as a publisher, um, and and so I, I kind of already had a little bit of of kind of um, uh, some stuff to fall back on in terms of in terms of thinking the process through. Um, and so uh, wound up deciding to start a company and, and put out my own book. Um, and then uh, uh, after a few years gone by, wound up adding uh, other titles. And I guess Mouse Guard was really the third or fourth title, I think, that we had signed. Yeah, I think it was number three. Back, I think number I was, three. I was, I was yeah. at least the third published of the new, of yeah. the new content. Yep. So, uh, um, so in a sense, a serendipitous moment, I think, for... Uh, for the company to have to have been, to have luckily found a, a book like Mouse Guard uh, uh, so quickly, so um, and uh, and then and then um, you know and then over the years, in the sense, Arkea got uh, got got bigger, and then and then now is owned by owned by Boom Studios. So that's uh, it's been uh, a, and a very long story condensed into about thirty. <laughs> <laughs> if if it only had gone that by that fast for the rest of us, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, a lot less headache for so many people. Right. <laughs> uh, the Artesia story in comic form has uh, has stopped, but you have kind of continued telling stories in that world with um, your first prose novel called The Barrow. Yep, uh, The Barrow came out a few years ago, uh, published by uh, Pyre, which I don't, I, it's hard to tell whether Pyre really exists anymore. At the time, they were the, uh, the, the sort of the fantasy sci-fi imprint of a company called Prometheus, and then... Uh, Prometheus wound up selling all of its uh, um, uh, non-academic uh, imprint lines off to another company, which doesn't seem to actually be a publishing company. It's more like an IP holding company. So, hmm. um, so at the moment, uh, the the Barrow is it's still in print, but uh, the sequel, in a sense, is that I'm working on now. Uh, I will I will oddly enough probably wind up uh, exploring self-publishing. <laughs> so I, I find myself in a it's a cycle. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The uh, uh, the Black Heart is the sequel. Right. Uh, I found a release date, but I guess you're you're giving us the info that. Uh... Oh right, I would assume that the the release date is probably what Pyre had told people. Sure. Uh, back back when uh, back when I was still working on it, and uh, and that yes, that release date is no yeah. is no longer the case, and it's not it's not coming out from Pyre in effect. So, there we go. Uh, or or whatever Pyre is now in, a, in, a, in effect. So. Um, well, back when you were still with Archaea, uh, and when Archaea was Archaea, uh, purely Archaea, right. um, you did a pinup for uh, the first series of Mouse Guard, this pinup of the Black Axe. Uh, I specifically asked you to do, uh, a ma I think, I'm, at least I'm pretty sure, I asked you to do a mouse in armor. I might, yes. actually, I might be... <laughs> Is that what I asked you for this, or was that what I asked you for the legend story? I know at some point I was like, "You do really nice armor. Can you draw a mouse I, in armor?" I think for the first one, it was it was actually this pinup that was very, that was specifically phrased as a mouse in armor. Okay. And, uh, so uh, uh, so obviously the black axe had had seemed like a really obvious kind of mouse in armor kind of like path to go. So um, uh, so yeah. So hence hence the hence this pinup as it were. So um, the the uh, 
the, it was funny. I guess it, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think if I remember correctly, you were having um, guest pinups on every issue, right? So it was, that was well, sort of or, that. originally it was going to be I had uh, because I had Guy Davis do issue one and issue two. I was going to continue that cycle, and then the person who was going to do issue three, something fell through. We got somebody else, and then I was like, at this point, we might as just do individuals and get uh, and get five other creators. Um, or f uh, four other creators. So, um, and yeah, I loved your armor, and and Jeremy had already agreed um, to do some pinups. Right, so. I remember Jeremy. Yep. Course, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then actually, that leads to Legends of the Guard when there was exploration about the idea of doing more with Mouse Guard, um, and and there was uh, there was a little bit of talk about even like, oh, do we? And this was a <laughs> this was a suggestion from someone who ended up corporately owning. Archaea, even though you were the uh, more the chief creative uh, person, but yeah, from from kind of top corporate was like, hey, David's slow. What if we get somebody else to draw mouse guard for him? <laughs> um, and I thought like, well, maybe a way to slow that down is let's 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 find a way to release some more mouse guard to make publisher happy, but let's not do what he just said. And I thought, what about doing a spinoff that would be um, a way to get guest artists who have already done things like pinups to come back. And explore more and it was specifically yours and jeremy's uh two pinups were the ones where i was like yeah one pinup from mark smiley and two pinups from jeremy bastion aren't going to be enough of of them drawing mice we need more we need more and so i pitched that idea i said let's do mouse canterbury tales and i think i had already talked to you and jeremy and said hey when i go to pitch if i say i've already got mark on board i've already got jeremy on board um can I can I use your names to, to throw some weight around and uh, and it worked. We got Legends of the Guard out of that. <laughs> yes, it was that, that was it was not a hard sell. I think uh, uh, that that yeah any 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 more Mouse Guard in a sense was was going to make uh, uh, was was going to make the top folks happy at that time. So, <laughs> so was, um, but uh, uh, well, and I'm happy yeah, we I mean, got I, to do. I'm happy we got to do it the right way and not just uh, yes. turning a crank. Yes. Right, and and I, I think the Canterbury Tales reference, in a sense, was really at least for me was was I thought was very exciting that idea of a, a Canterbury Tales of a Cappaccio's to Cameron that kind of like you know round robin table that sort of like storytelling kind of thing was was a great idea, and then and then I can't remember how when, when in in your original pitch if you had included the idea of the framework of the inn as the uh, as the as the storytelling site, but uh, but that I, I always loved was that, that once that sort of emerged as the um, as the, the context for the storytelling, I thought it was a great, uh, a, a great way to sort of explore uh, the universe of, uh, of Mouse Guard. So, Thank you. Know. Here are some of the sketches that uh, you sent me back when uh, you were starting. I'm, I'm curious where the origin of this story came from for you. Where? Oh, sure. Well, how did, uh, how did you go from, hey, Mark, would you do a story to this one? I, you know, it's funny. I have to admit, I cannot remember. Uh, you, you had you had introduced the idea of the gold crown and silver crown, if I remember correctly. I, I had already started doing some covers for issues. And, uh, and yeah, I, I remember seeing yep. right, that cover and thinking to myself like, oh, this is a kind of a curious piece of, of the mouse history. Because obviously in, in the current, uh, when we see the mouse world in the first book, there's, there's a there's a seemingly, at least at least at first glance, you know, there's that notion in a sense that, that the mouse world is sort of united, right? And then it's only in the in the course of the story that you that you realize mm -hmm. that sort of like there are tensions within the the sort of the mouse the mouse universe, right? Yeah. Um, so so the the when I had seen this picture of the of the gold crown and the silver crown uh, sort of fighting each other with the the notion of like, oh right, there's this whole past. Uh, in a sense that can be explored and this notion of like sort of the, the sort of the angle of politics I sort of thought was like kind of an interesting one so uh, but obviously the world that we see of Mouse Guard at least starting in the in the first literally the first pages right of of, uh, of, of, of Mouse Guard number one was sort of it, it kind of that was there's the surface idea that like at the moment so pr presumably the mouse world is sort of uh, is sort of united um, so in my head there was a there had to be a transition moment in a sense from when there was this previous tension between the gold crown mice and the silver crown mice, um, and then, in a sense, the current world. So, so I started to play with the idea of of how to, 
you know, what would be something that could have ended this rivalry between these two different mouse kingdoms and then, and then eventually produces sort of a, a sort of a more peaceful unified era. Um, the story I wound up kind of in my head is it's really, it's basically an adaptation of the story of King David, King David and Bathsheba. Uh, so I, uh, obviously, uh, from, uh, from the Bible, most of us remember King David as the King of the Israelites who kills Goliath, right? So there's the story. Of, yeah. Uh, story starts out great where he's a giant killer and then. Right. So it starts as a giant killer. Uh, but, but there are, but the, as King David in a sense becomes older and, uh, and, and sort of, uh, um, uh, settles into being a king. There are moments when he's a great king, and there are other moments when he sort of shows that he's human. Uh, and and one of those is in the story of Bathsheba. So Bathsheba was a, was the wife of one of his generals, a guy by the name of Uriah the Hittite. Um, and one day King David is up on the roofs of Jerusalem, and he looks down and he spies Bathsheba taking a bath, uh, as is perhaps appropriate for her name. Uh, and uh, and and falls in what we could, I mean, I think is more prosaically referred to as falls in love at first sight, but, you know, lust might, lust, be, the, yeah. might, right, might be the more accurate term. Um, and so King David, um, uh, realizing who she is and, and seeing that, that she's married to one of his generals, decides to send off Uriah the Hittite on a super dangerous mission. And of course, Uriah the Hittite dies, and therefore Bathsheba becomes a widow, and King David is then able to court her. So, uh, so I, I had, I for whatever reasons that that story kind of popped into my head and and i kind of thought like okay well let me take this story and kind of apply it to the mouse world uh and so in, in effect on the in, and and so in the in the very first images that you have on page one are are in effect the mouse king who is who is this story's version of king david and then and then his uriah the hittite who is this heroic sort of mouse general and then our heroic mouse generals uh lovely betrothed uh who uh um, who, in a sense, is, is uh, becomes the king's uh, uh, sort of um, uh, fixation, uh, in, in very quickly in the story. So, uh, so um, I, obviously, I changed the ending of the of the King David Bathsheba mm -hmm. story. Well, we'll get to um, we'll get to that when we get to the later pages. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what we'll um, so. um, two things on this page that I wanna I wanna ask questions about. One is well, actually three things. One is um, the names. Avidar, Garo, or Garo, uh, and Moira. Um, any any significance to those to those names? Where do the I names know. come from? It's funny. Those those names were you know I usually when I do naming in, in a fantasy context, um, I just start I start writing things down and I just kind of play with the way that the 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 the, the names sound. Uh, and so uh, in each case, uh, um, it was sort of um, uh, trying to find. Uh, a name that just sort of sounds good in my head, uh, but in this particular, I mean, sometimes there are names in a fantasy context that, that will have a very specific kind of like reference or, or whatever that I'm that I'm trying to invoke, but in this particular case, I don't remember or at least any any kind of like really specific kind of like uh, um, okay uh, kind of throwbacks of like oh this is a reference to X or Y right, or Z. Right. Right. So um, the layout but, of this um, page. I mean, the king's oh. name. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. I was going to say, I mean the supposed to sound sort of like you know like this sort of important man's name and then and then the uh the general's name at least is supposed to supposed to sound i think in my head was supposed to be a little bit more like a commoner's name of sort of like you know he's, Working class. So he's a mouse general but he's not like you know he, he's he's a he's not like an aristocratic mouse he's more like a everyday mouse as it were so the uh the panel layout i know that uh, you know a lot of legends people would would uh look at the way i lay out a page with the panel breaks and try to emulate that so that it felt more mouse guard. Um, but beyond that, with this page, I feel like there's a, a conscious decision to try to echo what would be the fourth page of the first issue of Mouse Guard. And it's it's where we first see uh, Kenzie and then uh, Liam in the middle and Rand, or I'm sorry, uh, and, and Saxon on the outside. And the top panel is is kind of a, a landscape. So it's it's exactly that of like the first moment we get to meet guard yeah, mice. It was, it was that, 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 yes, the, the layout was, was, if I remember correctly, was very deliberate there of feeling like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to invoke that. Um, obviously it helped that there were three characters that I was trying to introduce there. So it's like, you know, there was, it's an easy template in a sense to, to sort of follow. Um, but in, in a way, uh, and I mean, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but there, there is a mouse, there is a guard. There's a there's a guard storyline that emerges at the very end, mm -hmm. right? So so in a sense, I did wanna I did wanna kind of invoke that a little bit also. So there's also um, a color. But thing. I, and a lot of 
Sure. Uh, there's a color thing going on too with uh, the primary colors, the, the red cloak, the, the red colors, and then yellow in the middle and blue on the outside. Um, was, was that a conscious uh, choice as well? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, Moira obviously as a sort of a white mouse with the blue cloak in a sense is, is, is supposed to stand out um, and so that instantly you can see her in any, in any picture. Um, and then red historically has always been associated, uh, you know, red and purple are usually royal, are royal colors. In fact, I mean, along with gold, right? So, so, um, so the king, in a sense, is supposed to immediately also invoke kind of like the, the sort of the notion of a, of a very specific color set. Um, and then the, 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 the general mouse, in a sense, I mean, part of it was like wanting his copper armor in effect, uh, it wasn't, you know, the sort of, there was always that question of kind of like, what, what would mice work in? What kind of muddles would, <laughs> would, would be appropriate for mice? Um, but, uh, but also in also thinking a little bit about like a time frame, wanting it to look more like kind of like a bronze or a copper than, um, than iron, right? So okay. in a sense, sort of the notion that iron or steel kind of implies like a slightly later technological thing. And then, so, so the armor colors I wanted to give to the mouse were, were more, um, uh, we're more, we're, we're a bit more earth done, but then also because uh, later we see him kind of going through the woods, and so I wanted to invoke the idea that that for, even for a general mouse, that like like the note, that you would still be wearing something that was that would kind of have to be a little rustic and a little blend in, like mm -hmm. not exactly camouflage, but like you're not walking around in the woods with like a super. If you're a mouse, you're not going to wear like a super bright right. white shirt or something similar. You know, so. Um, so he's, he's, you know, the, I've, the guard at least are, I've always thought of them as being quasi rangers, right? You have that kind of, you know, classic ranger vibe, uh, to the guard. So for me, uh, these guys, the, 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 he's not supposed to be a, um, he's not a, uh, he's not a, he's not a guard mouse, but he's, you know, I wanted to kind of have a similar vibe so that yes, he's a, he's an army mouse, but it's like they're, the, um, an army of mice is still more like an army of rangers than it is. <laughs> <in a sense. laughs> right. Yeah. You know. Like it's not, it's not, you know, it's it's a different, it's a different kind of, different kind of vibe. So, um, right. and then and then um, I did want to include, yeah. in a sense, very early on, sort of that establishing shot of the uh, of the landscape, a little bit to sort of just give of the imagery. So, I have uh, your your yeah. pencils here from that page. Um, and you, you penciled the whole thing and sent roughs sure. over for approvals, which was a really surreal experience for me to be approving your pencils as you started as my publisher. Um, but you, you did all of these. And then the final pages are watercolor with ink and all the text is added digitally later. Yeah. But what's your what's your transfer um, I, I, method? So I can oh, actually hey, uh, there it is. show you. I, hopefully, I don't know whether whether you. You can can see this very well in the in the on the on the screen, but um, so that I actually still have some of the pages, the original pages from uh, from the story. So I, I uh, did them on. They're about the image area is about twelve by twelve, uh, kind of kind of traditional <laughs> traditional mouse guard. Um, those are not. They I mean the thumbnails I probably did on, and usually I do thumbnails on on an eight. By 11 typewriter paper or whatever whatever is just that so the pencils went onto a larger sheet so there could be 12 by 12 um, and then i used a, um, a flatbed scanner uh, to uh, to scan the images in once they were done um, and it's funny back in those days uh, i i didn't do a lot of uh, of digital um, effects or alterations once this image is scanned other than a little bit of color correcting mm -hmm. um, I think oddly enough when I work nowadays like some often like the final image is just it's like almost a composite or whatever where I'm, I'm working with several different um, uh, physically made images plus digital layers and all sorts of other stuff so it's a, it's a bit not exactly quite mixed media but um, uh, but certainly much more than than how I used to work uh, where it was like you know what you had on the page was what you had on the page right of, so uh, that was that was supposed to be the final thing. So, um, I own an Artesia uh, page. So yeah, so then it was uh, it was just scanning. I think uh, nerd that I use is very, uh, right. The yeah, the Artesia I, pages in a sense are more, you know more traditional size, eleven by seventeen. And so yeah. that I had picked up a scanner a long time ago that could 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 carry that on a flatbed, and it's just wide enough to get the twelve by twelve also. Yeah. So I was gonna say I I, I own so, an Artesia uh, page luckily, where um, the type is actually set. You you have you know printed out all of the, the word balloons or text boxes and, and uh, actually adhered them to the page. Yeah, it was funny. I mean, since I was doing all of it uh, uh, when I was doing Artesia, like for me, it was very much, 
I wanted the final page to include the letters because for me the letters and the word balloons are actually part of the comic art in effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when I, I mean, as, I mean, I, you know, I like this page yeah. as it is, but to me, oddly enough, without the word balloons, it's it's not really comics in, in a way, right? So in effect, the word balloons in effect are kind of what transitions transition something from being to me a um, just, just in effect a, a piece of art or a piece of illustration into being comic art and comic illustration. Um, obviously for most people who are artists in comics, um, you're not doing the lettering. Uh, and, and many people aren't doing the writing either, right? right. So, so those of us that, that do both writing and illustration, uh, you know, we're a small sliver, right, of the overall comics. It's very few uh, of us. Uh, producer, right. So, um, so I think for a lot of artists, when they look at the comic page, they're like, no, no, look, I just did the art. So I want a page that's just the art because that's what I did. Um, but as someone who was both writing and drawing my comic at the time, I was like, well, I'd like, I mean, the words, I'm making up the words, right? Sure. So I might as well have all of them on the page. And, uh, and, and so there was a very deliberate part of me that was like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to include, I'm going to actually going to take the, the word balloons and I'm going to glue them to the page and that's where they are. Part of that, I will also admit, is a, is a little bit of a time saver because obviously I didn't bother to draw underneath where all of the word balloons are. So I could save myself, you know, just a tiny little bit of time by just being like, oh, this whole corner I know is going to have a word balloon, so I don't need to put a word balloon here. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to paint here. I need to do anything. So, so if the word balloons ever fall off of the original <laughs> art, you will need to glue them back because otherwise there will probably be a little blank white space where where there is no longer a word balloon. So <laughs> I I go the opposite. I actually draw and and completely color. Uh, even knowing that there's going to be balloons. And, and actually, sure. the, the reason is because, and this came up kind of early in Archaea, where there were needs for marketing purposes, merchandising purposes, um, whatever. It was like, this panel would be great, except we have to crop all the way down here to get rid of the <laughs> balloon, or now you have to draw in a patch. And it was like, if I right. just draw the image clean, we can use it anywhere we want, anytime right. we want. I, I have to admit that yes. Now, nowadays, if I were to be doing comic art, that is also how I would be working in the sense that, like, I, I do think that, like, and but, but a part of that is in part because also because, like, I think increasingly I feel, like, I, as just as an artist, I do more digitally than I did back then. So in a sense, it's it's just as easy to go in and now create the digital layer um, and then do the word balloons, yeah. etc. Uh, et at the digital end and just feel that that's that's you know, the same thing. But yeah, I, I have to admit that nowadays, I, in effect, they, it, it would look more like this in the sense that it would be complete art yeah. rather than rather than art plus word balloons. So, um, so let's move on to page two. Sure. Uh, we've we've got Avadar, uh, or Avadar, uh, obviously stalking, <laughs> Stalk, <laughs> stalking Moira, just yes. uh, watching her. Uh, but this uh, this town architecture now you know I'm I'm a stickler for for wanting to know architectural you know where where'd that come from how did you draw that sure. um, is this based on every anything you you I know you didn't build a model you're not stupid enough like me to build a model of this place but was it based on a real place did you have photo reference did you just dream it up uh, no well it's uh, oddly enough what I what I had photo references for was actually. Um, uh, some of the the exterior landscape shots uh, when they're in were actually based on it, it was I walked in a part of uh, Pennsylvania and had taken a bunch of pictures that uh, that I that that just I had, I think it had, you know maybe the hike had been like only a month or two before we started doing this project so uh, so I it was just fresh in my mind and so I'd, I'd gone in and and so some of the landscape shots are are actually based on 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 specific trees or streams or whatever that i had seen in a, in in a, in a pennsylvania hike um oddly enough the town uh was was almost just entirely made up i i, I had a i had an idea kind of of what I, w I kind of made a few like sketches to sort of be like okay this is this is kind of what it needs to look like and and uh and what the what the features would be uh you know obviously in particular that there needed to be like a little like sort of like town square where uh, some of the action would take place, uh, there needed to be places where the roses uh, would be would be growing in the background. Um, but uh, but no, that so that that town uh, sadly was was not was not super planned out. It was it was more more just sort of sketching in a few things where where uh, where knowing what I needed. Um, part of the reason, in a sense, for me for doing the layouts was to figure out okay, how much of the town do I need to actually figure out. 
um, in a sense, if, if this were a thing where if I if this were an ongoing story where where I was planning on coming back to this town again and again, I probably would have done more development on the town itself just to make sure that like, OK, I know I know where where, you know, since I'm going to be needing this again in the future, what else does it does it have to have? But in this case, I knew that there were only like, you know, two or three parts of the town that I needed to worry about. And most of it was just that central square uh, where uh, uh, where where the, the king and Moira would have a series of encounters. Uh, yeah, here on the page three, we see kind of his his throne area. Right, a little throne room for the for king. Um, yeah. What uh, what what was your watercolor technique? What kind of watercolors were you using at the time? Uh, I want to say it's. I mean, it's it's a mixture uh, of. Uh, uh, I, I I had a actual. Oh, if I, if I can find it, if you hang on one second, I may even be able to pull it up. Uh, is how often uh, watercolors from different companies actually look different, right? Sure. Um, and so uh, somewhere I had stumbled across a book that had someone had actually gone through the process of creating samples of almost every major color from every single major watercolor producer. Um, Sounds like something James Gurney would do. <laughs> right, exactly. It was, if Gurney hadn't done it, then somebody... Somebody would have had to do it for him. Right. Thankfully, I did find it. So it was it was the Wilcox Guide to the Best Watercolor Paints. So I don't know if there we go. That's that's cool at all. So, uh, so in effect, I so I, I have. Uh, I mean, it's it's a mixture really of Windsor Newton, Grumbacher, a bunch of other companies, uh, Marlieri, uh, a couple other European companies, um, Old Holland. Uh, so. Um, and, and many of them were, were literally just me going through the Wilcox guide and being like, oh, I like this particular color tone of Payne's gray or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then going out and, and then tracking it down and then and then, and then finding it. So um, I, I don't know if that book is still in print, but uh, I, for if for anyone that works in watercolor, I do think it's a it's a really fabulous uh, uh, resource. So. Um, uh, I mean, I, that that assumes obviously that uh, given you know the question of whether, you know, whether the paint formulas are still the same. Oh sure, like, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> probably like those artists, th those artist uh, guide books, um, like artist guide to the market. Uh, they have to put one out every year because everything changes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Everything changes. Yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah. So I, w I was this. This in fact actually is already billed as an updated edition. So <laughs> there is. There is. Yes. There's going to be. There's going to be more than more than one version. So. Um, but if, but yeah, if if uh, if, if anyone uh, watching is a watercolor painter, then that's those are, that's a that's a really a, a really handy guide. So, um, and it, and it's funny because it's it's still true to this day that, for example, like you know, I I, I use a uh, I, there's a there's a very specific burnt sienna that I use for for a lot of skin tone colors, and it's like other burnt siennas just are not the same. So I I, I have to go out and find that one. I want to say it's a Cotman Cotman watercolors, which is it's actually a fairly inexpensive watercolor uh, 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 brand but they're but I just happen to like their yeah their version of burnt sienna more than any other <laughs> version of burnt sienna so, so um, but uh, but uh, but yeah so uh, so those were uh, I would I would use uh, you know depending on so depending on which uh, which which color brand I, that, I, that I liked uh, um, and usually I would do the, the, the process is usually for me is uh, is to do the pencils first and then do um, then paints on top uh, then I'll come in and do all the ink lines and then come in and in effect do a second watercolor sort of touch up or, or strengthening where, you know, finding places where I missed a spot and then uh, and then kind of reinforcing it. And then in effect coming in with either colored pencil and or uh, and inks again at the at the final. So it's kind of every every image sort of has two rounds on it uh, of both the, the watercolors and the inks uh, to get to the final. So. I've had this discussion with um, Justin Gerard several times about the nature of um, using some kind of a medium where you're where you're supposed to be rendering uh, in a painterly way, uh, whether it's digital or watercolor, right. but then also being maybe somebody who is more of a line person, and that I have my own conflicts with that. That I I can only render so far because I'm essentially coloring a line drawing. But there's always going to be lines there. The lines are the foundation. I can't, I can't obliterate them, or it becomes a painting. And the the third panel here, I think, is a really interesting um, kind of combination where you've 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 straddled those two lands, 
uh, you've, you've strode across those two lands, while the line drawing defines the two characters in the foreground, and, and then the paint is just reinforcing those lines, the, the background is a painting. In fact, it's, it's even giving a, a sense of, of blur, of, of uh, depth of focus. Yeah, I think uh, uh, part of one of the things that's, that's uh, I mean, for me, comic art is line based art, right? Uh, so there's no question that I mean, there, there's definitely, you know, there's a handful of us that, that are that are painters, purely painters, and never let line work kind of come near the come near the page. Uh, but uh, but I sort of, you know, that's that's increasingly rare, right? Um, I always I always do both watercolor and line work, because for me, the line work is sort of what is is line work is what makes the comic medium to me the comic medium right so um i mean you know it, you can look at a great alex ross page and go oh my god this is amazing but i i have to admit that for me you know like i, I always it's, it's still it's something to me alex ross's work for example that's just as one example is sort of like it's it's com it's a different kind of comic art to me than than what, what most comic art is to me which is which is very much based on lines um, and so, but one of the nice things about being, when you are using watercolor or for any other painting medium, and I, I mean, even guys that do um, do this with, uh, um, do this digitally can theoretically do this, is precisely being able to make decisions about where where you're gonna use line work and where you aren't. And, and so for me, um, uh, and in effect, you know, the same way that in, as in vision, like distance creates haze, you mm -hmm. lose the outlines, you lose detail, then that's an, it's a great way in comic, in, in the comic art to be able to, to, uh, to create those distances. Just, yeah, foreground, lots of line work, and then background in a sense is, uh, it gets, everything gets a little hazy and the line work kind of dissipates, gets smaller, thinner, and then, and then ultimately disappears altogether. Um, and so, uh, uh, and then, and then you combine that in effect with color choices, right? Um, when, when you're nowadays, in a sense, because so much coloring is done digitally, in a sense, you, you, add, you there has to be a dialogue in effect between a digital colorist and then the original penciler or inker about, okay, hey, where can I go in here and take your line work and make it not black, right? right. And so I take black line work and I give it a color, or I fade it out, or do something with it to start to create that sort of like sense of distance. Uh, and you know when you when you look at some you know I think to me I I always feel like the best digital colorists are people that understand that and then start to go into the line work and start to 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 just sort of create those kind of distinctions between foreground background etc. Yeah. Uh, by by using their color by transparency etc. So um, so it's it's uh, it's it, it becomes a uh, uh, um, uh, it's I, I mean it's it's a uh, it's. I, it's it's actually I think in many ways it's actually easier to do when you're actually working with an actual physical medium and can make those kinds of decisions as you're going along, hmm. um, but a lot of that is just a process issue of whether it's one person versus many people doing it. So. Yeah, I think I, I think the ease comes in from it coming from one brain as opposed to tr trying to be the work of many. Right. Right, exactly. Right, so here we go, page three. I'm actually proud to say I own this page. I didn't even know that you were selling any, and I it uh, I got like a Google alert that it was up for auction. And uh, and I put in a bid and I won. Uh, oh, that's weird. Uh, so I, you, you did not buy that from me then. I mean, I, you bought it from somebody no, else. No, it was it was it was back around the time that this had been published. It wasn't it wasn't anything recent. Um, and I think you had donated it for a, it was a charity thing. I think it was like money yeah, for right. the Red Cross or something like that. And so uh, yeah. obviously happy to happy to donate um, and and bid on it, but also uh, happy to own the piece. It was a you know. And I love that it had that nature panel, that that tree with the exposed roots. Um, and uh, then, right, as an example, actually, that that was based on a photograph of a of a tree by a stream that I had found on that hike in Pennsylvania, and I just loved the way the roots worked. So I, I kind of tried to capture some of that in the in the piece. So. Um, and then in that second panel, there's more of that depth that you're talking about, where the, there is some line work, but it's dropping away. It's it's not it's not doing the heavy work. The shapes are doing the heavy work. Right. And I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, uh, it's, it's a very simple trick, really. But, uh, you know, in, in effect, thick lines are closer to the eye and then thin lines recede. Right. So so in effect, whenever if I am adding line work into the background, it's usually using a very, very thin pen nib and then and trying to make sure that it's sort of uh, 
um, you know, it's it's um, it's just the barest of outlines, kind of. Um, and then in the foreground is where you put the the heavy lines in effect, and then and then more lines, right? So more lines, heavy lines. That that brings the image. That brings whatever's in the image forward, and then and then um, and then thin lines or no lines makes it lots of receipt. So, um, I mean, it's a very simple trick, but at the same time, it's it's uh, it is one that uh, that maybe not not everyone picks up. It's hard. Way, it's so. hard to learn. It it. It's, it's deceptively simple. Uh, pan panel four here, you are um, you're, you're doing one of my favorite things about uh, the decision for lettering in comics and as to whether or not it is a font or whether or not it is part of the art. And my distinction right. always is, um, and I, I love people who do sound effects and hand letter their own sound effects or even hand letter their own comics, but the distinction for me where I decide where I draw the line of what I'm going to draw in the comic versus what's just going to be done with a font later is if the mice can see it, it gets drawn. Right. Exactly. In a sense that you, you should distinguish, uh, you know, in effect between the things that are in world and then the things that are out of world. Right. And so, well, so and, yeah, and se you're... sound and dialogue is in world, but it can't be visualized. Right. Right. Exactly. The, the visual world, I should say, right. of what's, of what, with the mice or, or any character at this point I mean, you know, so, is, uh, is seeing right so so yeah I, I always you know if your uh, inscriptions on buildings or something that's on a on a on a piece of paper the, the only exception I would I would think about would be is um, is if, uh, if if you're drawing a modern comic and somebody's looking at a computer screen like I then that's one sure. of those instances where I would sure. I would use a sure. where I would use a font but uh, uh, but yeah any anything that is uh, um, you know, sort of, you know, particularly, I think, in a fantasy comic, of sort of yeah. the idea of, of uh, a, yeah, let, that should be that that should be that should be hand lettered, in effect, rather than rather than e a, a digital. Even screen. in modern comics, where they will use um, like a like a DC comic, where they want to have you know Wayne Enterprises on the front of, um, you know, Bruce's building or or a newspaper headline, you know, Joker shocks Gotham or whatever like that needs to be hand lettered. I'm sorry. You can you can use the font to do the layout to figure out all your spacing and and the shapes of the letters, but light box that and ink it in. Or the yeah. letterer needs to distress it more because it sticks out like a sore thumb. Like it just jumps out at you that this is a font sitting on top of artwork. And it drives yeah, it me does. crazy. Uh, well, sorry, I, uh, years ago, uh, Mike Mignola had been interviewed about some of his art techniques, and his he made the argument, in effect, of uh, never never use a straight edge when you're in the inking part of the process, hmm. right? So, in effect, whenever you're whenever you're whenever you're getting to that, you know, if you want to use a straight edge in the in the penciling, sure, but like when you finally get to doing the final thing and you're inking it or whatever, his argument was always use freehand, always go freehand because that's kind of, that's the art. Part of it, right? Like in a sense, if you if you have an image, and then there's obviously there's a few there's exceptions to this, I would think. I mean, there's there's a couple of you know very famous artists who, who use lots of straight edge, right? Sure. But um, sure. Uh, but I think I, I I think for many artists that yeah, like the the organic sense of like a freehand drawing a line is very different than somebody going in and mechanically creating that. Yeah. Um, and so the same thing is true for handwriting. It's also going to, yeah, it's going to remove the separation between the character and environment too. If you, if you right. are very technical and use a ruler and a, a very precise pen to do the architecture or the setting um, where the character is, but then the character has freehand lines and, and slight imperfections, um, it, it, it's going to separate them out like, like animation cells. You're going to be able to, right. to see the background from the yeah. foreground right. in not a good, not yeah. a flattering way. I think that's particularly true with uh, with fantasy comics or fantasy illustration in the sense that um, that you know you could you could maybe argue I suppose that you know a modern um, uh, a mo in the modern world or a futuristic world where there's sort of precision, precision engineering you know that that you could argue that yes there are actually straight lines right like right. you can see a building or a room or a piece of furniture that's actually got straight lines on it uh, but but certainly in an era when things are being handcrafted. For the most part, like you're, you're not going to, you're probably not going to have that kind of precision. So if you were looking at a, what's supposed to be a medieval building or, or whatever, and then and you're seeing a lot of straight lines, it's going to be like eh, that's that's not really, <laughs> that's not actually how that building's going to look in a sense in real life. So yeah. So the, yeah. at that point, yeah, much better. And we all to, we all also learned from George Lucas back with the original Star Wars that a lived-in world, a worn world, 
right. is more appealing right. anyway. So even if the castle, the medieval castle, did have straight lines, the fact that there are chips and dings from, from arrow points hitting it or, or the stairs are slightly worn and sloped uh, just yep. from that many feet passing over them makes, uh, makes it believable. Uh, okay, so Hero Garo has, has arrived at the enemies, the, the other crowns, um, castle, citadel, and, and passed over the, the, the parchment that says, you know, if you kill this one soldier, the war will be over. And, uh, and, and the rest of the panelists, we have uh, Garo kind of fighting for his life, and we assume uh, that he's dead. Right. Yes. So, so yes, this is the, the moment of betrayal when the betrayal is actualized. Uh, and then, uh, and then the assumption, right, exactly, of, of, of his fate. And the the mouse uh, that is you know, hiding in the bushes there is, in effect, the advisor to the king, who has been dispatched uh, to, in effect, make sure uh, and confirm for the king the the fate uh, of of Garo, and then and then therefore Moira's uh, presumed availability on the marketplace, as it were, for <laughs> for the king to, to come in and swoop in and and, and uh, do his thing. So. Uh, so yeah, so the so the the, um, the the vizier mouse, as it were, like sees Garrow's helmet and then picks it up as the proof, in effect, that Garrow has uh, has bitten the dust or whatever yeah. whatever expression mice mice use for. They have dust. And they bite. <laughs> right. I mean, I, that's true. Yeah. So, okay, well, well. so here we are back at uh, back at that town that town square. You were um, also, you know, the first version we got of the town square and now this first panel and even the second panel, you were much more ambitious about drawing crowd scenes of mice than I was. And I have to assume that Artesia uh, prepared you for that. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I, uh, Artesia, I had, I spent a long, long time drawing many big crowd scenes. And it, there's always that question. I mean, you know, uh, there's, there's, you know, when you're dealing with, with uh, fantasy, there's, there's, um, Obviously, a lot of different flavors of fantasy, but but Artesia was very specifically epic military fantasy, and so you kind of have a choice, which is either when you draw an army, you kind of got to draw the army, or you kind of have to wave your hand and be like, well, I'm going to draw this shape in the background, which is the army, and then they have to kind of fill that. And I, I have to admit that I, I went with, I'm going to draw the army. So um, so so yes, I, I had a whole crowd of mice that were that were going to see, in effect, act as the witnesses mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, to this scene, um, and and. Uh, in effect, to uh, uh, to the king's initial presentation to her, uh, but then also, as we see in the final panel, in a sense, the revelation that perhaps uh, not everything is is uh, going the king's way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we need to talk about gore level, uh, which is uh, something that yeah. I always had to kind of yeah. uh, you know not worry about, but but at least be conscious of. Um, how did you, what were your thoughts when drawing um, this? Uh, how, how did you how did you walk that line when drawing, especially the first panel? Yeah, I think uh, I I sort of felt like uh, um, there were certain things that that uh, like, yeah, like he couldn't be missing a a, a, a complete limb, <laughs> right? Like there there couldn't be like any really obvious open wounds. Uh, you know, I think the. The chopped ear was was is potentially like a little, a little gruesome. Although it's, it's I mean it's funny. I, I actually had a cat for a very long time that had a lopped ear because that's what the, uh, uh, the ASPCA does when they when they um, fix a street cat. So mm. so I was kind of used to the idea of a of an animal with a kind of a slightly lopped ear. But uh, I, I do realize that could be kind of shocking for for particularly sure. obviously for younger members. Uh, you know that's, um, but uh, I, so I, I wanted, but I sort of felt like. Like since I, I I drew the line, I tried to draw the line mostly at like no obvious gaping wounds, <laughs> kind of. So blood, uh, you know, and, and sort of the lopped ear, and and, and uh, I th you know I think his eye is slightly kind of like kind it's of swollen over, shut. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, but nothing. Uh, seeing that, in fact, no no interior body, right? Like in a sense, like the, okay. the sort of the right. version of the, of, the, of, the, of a of a cut or a stab that had in effect opened him up kind of so so he could he couldn't be there like holding his intestines in right. so it's part of my, i've but, drawn I've, was, I've drawn uh uh mice with missing limbs in fact uh, uh you know in the, in the third book which hadn't come out by the time you were doing this but um in the third book right. i have kelanov take off conrad's leg right you know in in panel and i had to angle it just so so that we didn't see internal bits but yeah um, it's, that's my, exactly it's all in the angle but i i would uh, say actually the 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 odd thing is what I find the most 
disturbing about this like the the part that that sends the the twinge of like ooh he's he's in bad shape uh y- yeah the ear and the cuts and everything it's actually the the blood and the dirt it's the it's the surface uh it's the surface red um that yeah. i think is in in some ways like more disturbing than a missing ear or even a missing limb uh it's it's uh the there's i, I think often we get it's um uh, in a sense, the, there's a that all all animals, and presumably including mice, in a sense, you know, sort of grooming is sort of like this thing, mm-hmm. and so like cleanliness, yeah. the cleanliness of the of the body, of the presentation is sort of a is sort of a uh, um, a, a part of uh, a part of how all animals kind of function, and so so the fact that it, so the so it was sort of you know the grime and the dirt, he's dragged himself across the forest, obviously, right, you know, so. So it was sort of like he, he, you know, the notion that like he, he has to show up in a sense, sort of with, uh, with the physical, bearing the physical marks of both his fight, but then also his struggle home in effect. So, uh, so that, that had to be manifest both as, as not just blood, but then also, yeah. Yeah, I, I would hope if it, one way of thinking of this is it's still kind of a PG-ish image yeah. rather than it hasn't, I don't think it's moved into the R right. category. Yeah. We, Oh, right. <laughs> and that's a, and it's a hard so, and it's and you start uh, at least I feel this way when when you have to make that artwork when when you're the one making that distinction of like where is that line and how do I manipulate my art so that I stay one side or the other you start doing these little scrutinizations of like how much ear can I lop off how much uh, you know, <laughs> right. no no missing limbs was one for you or like how deep can that cut look how sw- can I make it. Uh, d- it, what if the eye is just swollen shut? Is that okay? If the eye is missing, is that too far? How much blood on the surface of the fur is too much? How much dirt is too much? Like, and you start really getting into these these like moving, uh, you know, moving atoms of of paint around to try to figure out how much is too much. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, obviously for uh, uh, for for most uh, um, publishers and and. Uh, um, I mean, even filmmakers, et cetera, like ever, throughout the, I mean, you know, sex tends to be the more the thing that we're, people are, I think, much more hyper aware right. of and then bad language, obviously, but, but, uh, but violence, particularly in a sense, when in something like Mouse Guard, which has uh, a, a, a young fan base, uh, although, I mean, it's eight to 80 is how we used to always refer to mm-hmm. it. So, but, but that eight to eight to 15 year old segment of that, right, you kind of do have to think about that and just be like, okay, well, so when, you know, Violence for an older audience, you almost never have to think about it, uh, really, as you know, as long as it's not too gratuitous. But then for for something like this, which has that overlap with younger readers, that it it, it always seemed like, yeah, you, you kind of always have to have the question of uh, of of the depiction of violence, or or really the, the both it's the, both the depiction of violence itself, but then also the depiction of the effects of violence, right? And the, and it's sort of, I think it's, it's always. I tend to feel like it is important that if you're going to present violence, prevent pre- present violence as part of a story, that you also have to show the consequences of violence, um, and and that means that people are getting hurt, and so yes, you know, so, and the emotional uh, consequences too, that that not just physically right. hurts people, physical, but emotionally, and physical and right, yeah. So visually, you have to see the physical, and then story-wise, you have to see the emotional. So. Yeah. So here in the last page, Moira has picked up her. Uh, her beloved's helmet and now she's she's grabbed also the staff of the king who has dropped it while he's celebrating his victory and whack right so in effect uh in effect unlike the king david and Bathsheba story which which ends with david in fact actually with Bathsheba, uh here moira in effect upon see, seeing the proof and the revelation revelation that the king has has betrayed her husband and does uh and is is lying to her and to the people uh, in effect, decides to to end, in effect, the king. So I mean, she realizes because both crowns are there that they, that the silver, the king of the gold crown mice, in effect, has has passed. And so, in killing her king, she has in effect freed the mice from an era of kings. And so, uh, in effect, the story at the end there is, is was in my head at least was sort of the the aim was to sort of a transition moment from when the mice were ruled by the kings to when the mice become uh, sort of more uh, more modern and are in effect uh, uh, ruled by themselves in the guard. In effect, so the, not not I, you know I, I don't think I, I 
never really thought of the mouse guard universe as necessarily being democratic in the sense of like I don't, I, I, I've never I don't remember the, the mice ever getting together to vote <laughs> in, this, in, any of, in any of the stories. Uh, but that notion, in a sense of more of like uh, of sort of the, the idea of collective responsibility rather than this hierarchical world in which there are kings with crowns and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. um, so and then so and then at the end, in effect, Moira is then presented in the in in her garb as a guard mouse. In effect, rather having 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 moved from simply being a citizen of the king to being a protector of the community that she that she comes from. So. And by the time I was getting around to doing Black Axe, um, so many of the legend stories were were so good, and and, and in some cases, like uh, I, I wanted to steal a little bit from everybody or for, from most people, um, and some of them were so good, like Jeremy's. I was like, I wish I wish I had come up with that story. I had already kind of contradicted some of it with some things that were in the role-playing game, but I was like, ooh, if I had known he was going to write this story, I just would have made this part of the origins of of the guard. Damn it. Right. You know, so um, I wanted to give some credence to all the parts of the legends that felt like they were just so real. They were so um, authentic to Mouse Guard that uh, I included Moira in the... Um, in the stained glass windows of the Hall of Matriarchs, uh, as like a, a founding, uh, founding or important, uh, you know, a, a matriarch of of enough note that she is celebrated that way. Um, and then a few years ago, I did a I did a print of her um, standing amongst roses, uh, a nod to Rose Stone, where she was from. Yeah, so I, I have to admit I couldn't remember if you had because uh, obviously I, I was I was using the rose visual motif throughout the town but i have to admit i couldn't remember if you had told me that the silver crown king came from rose stone or whether that was whether i simply did a did a uh, did a connection there on, on my own but uh yeah i don't i mean i know i did that artwork for our, uh for the um the legends cover that i showed um towards the beginning that was issue one's cover um, your story was in issue four of the first series, so there was enough time between when I would draw this and when you were turning it in that I think I would have come up with, because um, I, I had a little one paragraph legend for what each cover was, so I might have had those city names in here, but if not, you might have already turned in your, you know, your pencils and suggested those city names, and then I would have just been like, okay, well, there they are for my drawing. <laughs> I don't know who I don't know which one of us informed which one, but uh, once once uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that it was it was probably your that, that you had already probably done the text for the art so okay. at that point because I, I I'm pretty sure I did my story probably almost immediately after uh, after one had come out so uh, well so I would probably would have had the text when we solicited somewhere. right exactly yeah, so before. so somewhere in there right I I'd, I'd already seen that so I'm I'm thinking that was probably so that's I so I pulled it from that so. But, uh, but yeah, yours was yeah. one of the ones I wanted to I wanted to pull from. Well, we are just out of time. Um, Mark, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, where should we point them for uh, social media or websites or or what oh, have you? Uh, right. Uh, the easiest thing is uh, I have a Facebook page uh, under my my name, Mark Smiley, uh, spelled S M Y L I E, and uh, and usually post it's a it's an author page in effect, so that's where I post official official things having to do with. Uh, with books or uh, or other projects, um, there's a Patreon that is going on right now for the, for Blackheart since I'm basically self financing it. So and that uh, can be found on Patreon. And then somewhere I think there is still the website, uh, which is uh, I think nowadays officially called SwordandBarrow.com, which uh, which can lead you in all sorts of other directions, etc. So is Sword and the uh, the word and yes, spelled uh, out? Full, yeah, Sword and A and D all one word. Thank you, Mark. Okay, no, thank you, David. Sorry.